Right. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, before we get started, we thought we'd do some really quick introductions. Um, Gina, would you like to go first? Sure, absolutely. So I'm Gina Valeria, and I am co-presenting with Fawn today. Uh, we're both professors at Sonoma State. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Media and Communication Studies, and I'm a former journalist, broadcast and digital, and then digital communications, um, and coming at media literacy because I thought that if, if I just informed people, they would have what they need to better their communities. And now I realize that uh, we have to inform and give context and, and always be um, thinking about the media literacy side. So I'm really excited to be here with you today. And I'm Fawn. I'm in, um, I wear a lot of hats at Sonoma State. I'm in the curriculum studies and secondary education. So I do, I prepare um, English teachers. I also, um, focus on adolescent and um, digital literacies for the educational technology strand of the master's program. And I also teach literacy, just um, traditional, but with a multi-literacies perspective for um, K-12. And um, I came to, Gina and I connected because of my work with adolescents and um, digital and media literacy just was a really natural fit for us. And so, um, yeah, we're excited to collaborate and share um, some of our ideas and progress um, around what has become, you know, really an important and kind of all consuming thing, especially here in Northern California, and that is crisis response. Um, did we want to do um, introductions with the others? So since we're a small group and we could have an interactive session. Yeah. So who you are and um, what, uh, what you're either studying or career or career path and uh, what drew you to this session. Um, uh, Camilo, may we have you start, please? Well, like you said, this is Camilo. <laughs> <laughs> I am from Colombia originally and I live in North Carolina currently. I work here as an ESL coordinator in a K-12 school. Um, I've been in touch with critical media literacy since I used to work as a teacher educator down in Colombia in a, in a teacher ed for English teachers, but English is a foreign language. Um, so my work pretty much is to find connections between what we do and what critical media literacy scholars do as part of my commitment to spread the word and this awareness the critical awareness about what media and the role of media in our lives and the impact it has, not just on ourselves as humankind, but also to Mother Earth, pretty much. Um, that's all I can say right now. <laughs> and thank you for having us here for just opening this space for us to share. Thank you. Um, Reina, I see your camera's off. Are you able or willing to, to introduce yourself to us? Definitely. My name Thanks. is Raina Robinson, and um, I am the executive director of the Center for Urban Excellence, which is a nonprofit in the Bay Area. I also work for the County Office of Education as a youth services um, specialist focused on our reentry population. So reentry youth who um, are in foster care as well as homeless youth. And I teach our college and career, as well as our social media and digital literacy course. Oh, awesome. Great to meet you. Glad you're here. Um, Cheryl, same here. Are you able or, or uh, willing to, to introduce yourself? Thank you. Yeah, hi. Hi. Um, I'm Cheryl Meeker, and I, um, I'm working as a library assistant at the San Rafael Public Library in Northern California. And uh, we've I've recently just been able to start a media literacy campaign on our website and through our social media uh, channels. So, um, and just trying to tailor that for patrons who, you know, and other people who don't, I think they don't have a lot of time. So I've come at them with these kind of short things, kind of quick things twice a week. Um, and uh, this has been really great and eye-opening and I, uh, you know, think that think that I really need to um, get it a little more, uh, you know, create it, create it into, you know, make, make sure it's less binary in its approach. Um, so um, yeah, this, this, this whole um, symposium has been really great, help, helping me to learn how better to approach it for the, for the, for the public, for the general public. 
Oh, well, glad to have you here. Thank you so much, Cheryl. And Daniel. Yes, yeah, so my name is Daniel Cologne. I am a pre-service teacher in the credential program at Cal State Long Beach. Um, I became interested in media literacy through um, Dr. Noah Golden. Um, uh, I was in touch with him in a class that, all about cultural responsive pedagogy. And this semester I'm in a class about literacy. And since being in that class, I saw the parallels between co being culturally responsive and at the same time um, being um, able being able to invite students um, in any class setting to use their funds of knowledge and to use their backgrounds and um, use that to their advantages whenever they're learning about anything. Um, and I uh, hopefully will be student teaching in the fall of 2021 um, on the path to becoming a history teacher. So that's my goal. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Oh, history is so important. So thankful you're doing that. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, Gina, did you want me to share? I can go ahead and share. Okay. And what I'm also going to do is I'm putting in the chat um, a, a view version of our slides uh, and fun. I'll be working from that version. Um, and so I'll share my screen. And what Fawn and I want to do is, is have a conversation with you. So we've got some guiding slides and then we've got a little activity to do or ongoing, but definitely um, back and forth would be wonderful. So I am sharing my screen right now. And um, all right, so let me present. And these pictures will become relevant. I mean, they're relevant, of course, but we'll we'll talk about them in a minute. But Fawn and I want to focus on um, critical media crisis response. Um, uh, as as was mentioned, uh, time can be an issue, especially in a crisis, and can cause us to move quickly. Um, so in 2020, I mean, I it happens, but I, it feels as if 2020 it's just crisis after crisis after crisis. So I'm wondering if, if, uh, if you know, I, I guess we don't need to name them, but it might be instructive to just kind of name what, what crisis is kind of at the forefront of your mind or big story or, you know, anything like that is at the forefront of your mind right now and anybody can speak up. The climate. Climate, mm -hmm. uh, okay, climate, great. What else? Uh, COVID-19 for us in the library, especially trying to, trying to um, help patrons with their, you know, deal with it, trying to figure out when to open up fully or if not to, you know, right now we're doing a curbside uh, appointment system where we process all their holds and give them books at the curbside. Yes. I'm, you know, I'm on the board of the San Francisco Friends of the Library and we're struggling with the same, you know, same thing. So absolutely COVID and reopening and all of the, all of the stuff that's right, the risks and needs that surround that other other a uh, couple others um i think like the economic crisis is also something yeah uh, yeah economic crime crisis it feels looming actually um anything else even emotional crisis oh, yes <laughs> yes mental health. yes mental health. <laughs> how to cope with uncertainty and everything that's that we're going through Yes, absolutely. So, um, and I think mo we, we tried to get as many as we could, but you've brought up a few others too. Um, in Northern California and across the West, we're facing, or the US West, we're facing wildfires. Uh, of course, our elections, I'm thinking US centric here. So sorry, police brutality, Black Lives Matter. Conspiracy theories, which kind of reach out globally. Um, terror threats, uh, for us, it's white supremacy, but uh, it's different in different places. Me Too, domestic violence, um, food poverty and food insecurity around the world. All of these things are crises. Um, and so sorry. And so Fawn, uh, if you want to talk about Yeah, and so I think we just wanted to really highlight. So when we were thinking about so we were thinking about this because of all of those things that we mentioned. We're here in Northern California. We have constant disruptions um, due to fires. Um, COVID was, you know, all of the everything that came along with that climate. Um, so all of these issues. And so we really wanted to kind of focus in even further down on what crisis is. And so thinking about crisis as in the, you know, strict um, dictionary definition is a time of great danger or difficulty. But really what um, um, resonated with us was this um, 
idea that there are problems that must be solved or, a or important decisions that must be made. And on the next slide, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that happens in the moment, although we use that word, um, crisis has that sense of urgency with it. There's also those longer term um, crises that we have to come together for creative problem solving, like um, the climate, for example, or even um, going down to the community-based level. So COVID-19 in our area um, disproportionately affects Affects the Latinx community in the North Bay, for example. And so also thinking about when we're talking about decolonizing media and thinking about crises and creative problem solving, that makes the interaction with communities and what they need um, even more important. Yes. And um, so Gina, I know that you were going to say something else about this. I just got going. <laughs> oh, no. So, no, I love that you got going. And I wanted to point out to take it out of today, um, Nancy Bristow uh, is an, uh, a professor and an author and she wrote a book about the 1918 flu pandemic. And in it, she makes the point that uh, for the African-American community, if uh, from the news coverage of the time, she noticed that if the African-American community was affected, then they, they were framed as having weaker constitutions, not able to handle it. If the African-American community was less affected in certain areas, then that just proves that they're different. Look, and how weird and why aren't they as affected as we are? So you can't win for losing, right? Because the framing was coming from this Eurocentric place. And so when we talk about decolonizing media, it's really um, interrogating our own uh, approaches for, you know, what is the frame I'm putting on this? And, and in a crisis, we, we know when we have to make important decisions and get it right, mm -hmm. we tend to be rushing, right? Because it's a crisis and we want to get, get through it or, or, uh, there's a lot of emotional, um, uh, investment and we sometimes forget to really stop, take a breath as Fawn says, and, um, and, and get this right. Um, and on top of that, uh, misinformation and disinformation now uh, layer in and weave in to all of these things. Uh, Fawn, do you want to take these two? Yeah, and so as you said, and I like that you said on top of that, because we're thinking about all of this layering, right? So if we um, also consider um, in um, America, 73% of Americans, according to a Pew um, survey, go online several times a day or almost constantly. And I think those numbers um, are pretty similar globally. And then on oh, the next okay. slide, we have 71% of people, or young people, 18 to 29, who get their news on the internet. And um, we put internet in quotes so to represent that as more broadly. So it's not just our um, social media networks, but also because of um, the nature of the way that we interact with the internet between algorithms. So this morning we were talking a little bit about systems, right, that are in place. Um, if everything from algorithms all the way to um, our own filter bubbles where we are, you know, consuming a lot of um, media that just reinforces our own beliefs. And go and, ahead, Fawn. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> and so, um, so students' um, critical media literacy skills have been called um, bleak and dismal. So um, Daniel said he was going to be a history teacher. There was, um, and I'm, I had it written down so that I didn't mess it up, but there was a um, study out of Stanford around history students in secondary school and looking at their ability to um, critically analyze um, information. Um, they said that, you know, really the outcome was rather bleak. But we think there is hope. We actually think um, that we can make this work. And so um, I think you're all aware, but Fawn and I really wanted to drive home that young people actually really are interested in what's happening in the world. And I, I bet you've all found that through your work um, and they wanna figure it out. And if we don't provide a frame and guidance, then they're gonna figure it out anyway. And it just may be with the wrong resources, right? Like down the conspiracy theory road or, or you know, it's just like, you know, the quote, right or wrong influences that my parents were at least worried about. Um, young people, oh, go ahead. Well, oh no, I was going to say it reminded me of what Camilo said at the very beginning of this session, and that is that it was um, seeing how young people interact anyway with digital media that really inspired him to go in that direction. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, just to really emphasize that, um, that, you know, leveraging and oh and actually Daniel talked about the funds of knowledge that students bring with them really leveraging this kind of um, 
I, I don't know that I would call it fluency, but it's um, a facility that we often um, attach to technology, but um, a kind of um, facility that they also have with digital media that can really inform the way that we develop as more fluent critical media literacy um, folks. So and that brings us to acquired versus formal learning. And so what we see as, so earlier, um, Raina was say, um, talking about teachers who got caught in Zoom, um, say, stating that their students were digitally illiterate and all of the different problematic aspects around that conversation and, and the term digitally illiterate, you know, we could unpack that um, even further. But I think that what um, that comes to, um, what that made me think of in, relation to what we're talking about today is the are these aspects of acquired versus formal learning so our students are interacting in digital spaces um, they um, demonstrate that facility with technology um, that we um, don't necessarily have um, but it's an acquired learning and those are the things that happen you know subconsciously without formal instruction through immersion um, that are often critical to survival and then there's the formal learning aspects and that's what we typically frame as you know what we do in school right where it's conscious um, it focuses on methodology and rules explicit explanations um, there's like measurements for uh, mastery and um, form is really important but um, in my work with young people and their interactions with media I realized that they're already doing really sophisticated things um, with media whether it's um, you know their social media and um, different discourses depending on um, which communities they belong to um, all of these things are really complex um, use of language and images and semiotics um, and I um, started to look at how can we bring that into the formal learning space kind of like Daniel mentioned how do we really leverage what they're already doing, um, but not completely aware of. And so I think that that would be a good place, as um, we heard in the keynote this morning, that's a really good space for us to come together in these more formal learning spaces where we're learning from each other. Um, teachers don't have to come as expert in all things. We can um, you know, come with what we are expert in, and a lot of that is what um, Jean is going to really emphasize too. Um, so I want to give an example of, uh, of a young person doing all of these things with, with the acquired learning of being online and using TikTok and some of the formal learning that she has uh, received in school. She put together this little uh, TikTok video. And for those of you outside the US, if you haven't been following, uh, we have an anti-mask contingent and uh, reopen and uh, you may be facing similar things in, in where you live. But um, this is a TikTok about um, a protest in Michigan. Uh, and I did turn this down on, so I'm hoping it works. I saw a video this morning of people in Michigan protesting the stay at home order. Specifically, this woman caught my eye because of her insane roots. She's complaining she can't get them done, but that looks like a lot of growth for the duration of the stay at home. So I did some research. Turns out they've been under the stay at home order since March 24th. That's about 28 days. From there, I thought, well, how fast does hair typically grow? Turns out it's about half an inch per month. I also googled how long is the average woman's pointer finger, which will make more sense later, but just know it's about 108 millimeters. From there, I did some math to determine how much her hair should have grown in the 28 days that she's been under the stay-at-home order. It's about 0.45 inches. So then I did what any sane person would do. I grabbed a photo of her index finger, compared that to her roots, found out her roots are about three-fourths the size of that, or 81 millimeters, which also means that she started the stay-at-home with 2.7 inches of visible root, AKA she has not got her hair done since October. So I really love that. Um, but you can see that she got, she has all this formal learning, the math and the re, some of the research skills. And then of course her acquired learning to make a point that, that is actually really important in helping us understand and contextualize some of the information we're getting um, from, from, you know, protests or from our, you know, other places. Um, and, and so, and I wanna give another quick example of just meeting students where they are. I'm not sure what all of your experiences have been in the classroom, but, and this may not exactly relate to what we're doing, but it reminds me always that um, students do bring all kinds of stuff into the classroom and they may not need the same things I needed. Uh, for example, I was teaching my students how to cover an event 
And they kept saying, well, what do we do? And this is before COVID. What do we do? And I'm like, well, you go in, you, you ask for the PR person, you sit down and they're like, no, no, no. What? It turns out they just needed a blow by blow. You drive up or you walk up, you park, you go in, it's going to look like this. You ask for, and they really needed this very specific um, detail that I didn't think they needed, but in other ways, they're just so blown past me and what they know and how they view stories. And so I was like, oh yeah, meeting them where they are, giving them like filling in the blanks as it were, I guess. And so that's, that's one thing that I always remember. It's not a deficiency in any way, shape or form. It's, it's a thing. Uh, there is something in the chat. I just want to make sure. Um, oh, good, good. I'm so glad you liked it. Thank you. <laughs> um, and Reba Biba is the person, the TikToker who did that in case you want to look it up yourself. Oh, forgive me. Okay, there we go. Sorry, I'm muted. Sorry. <laughs> um, so building on those acquired skills, um, a lot of what we, what I've done with um, students in the past, and I think what G um, Gina has done as well, is make those skills more visible. So when you're starting with what they bring to the classroom, um, really kind of, you know, um, mirroring back to them all of the really great things that they already know and can do but also whenever we look at things like that TikTok example um, making the skills that go into place more visible that step by step that Gina was just talking about um, helping students be purposeful about creating and sharing information has everybody seen or has anybody seen the social dilemma um, I thought about this one a lot because um, they're, you know, they talk about things as simple as retweets and how, what kind of impact that can have on, um, you know, in just, just within our own social circles. And it was, it's kind of like the butterfly effect, right? Like sometimes we put little things out there and that could be, you know, go all, you know, all across the spectrum. And we've um, looked at things in my media literacy courses around cancel culture and, you know, things like that. What happens when we put things out there, but even some Thing as seemingly innocuous as a retweet can have real implications and also communicate something about ourselves. So like when we were talking earlier, um, or they were talking about in the keynote about, um, you know, tracking and, you know, all of the different things that happen behind the scenes that our st um, students tend not to be aware of. But once that awareness is there, it changes everything. Um, emphasize those impacts um, or real world implications. And um, Gina will talk a little bit more about this as well, because she's done a lot of work with um, looking across, talking about um, different topics across differences and connecting students, um, like thinking about how we can humanize and deconstruct construct um, misinformation together. And I also heard that in a lot of um, the things that brought you here today, what was said at the beginning of the session. Yeah. And that humanization is, um, is, I think, the key to keeping us in the media literacy space and not nudging us toward the conspiracy theory space. Because conspiracy theorists, as some people are talking about, and Renee Hobbs uh, is, is talking about this a lot as well right now, um, they also use the critical media literacy and digital media literacy tenets to defend their work, uh, such as individual agency. Like, I am going to look this up myself. I'm not going to just believe whatever is told to me. Um, although that sort of is a double-edged sword, right? The skepticism. I'm not going to believe the official sources. I, I know better. Uh, the critical reading. I'm going to read this so critically that I'm going to find holes in it. Unfortunately, that it's the framing, right? Looking for the specific holes you want to find. Investigating, doing research. Uh, even the participation aspect. Um, if I'm participating in a group of people who believes this, then I feel like I belong. I feel like I'm part of something. So, so DML and CML have been have definitely got, gotten into the conspiracy theory realm. So, how do we separate those out? I think we're going to get to the meat of what we want to work with you today on, um, and that is that is this idea of engagement and not just engagement with people in your echo chamber. That's that's the realm that's ripe for misuse or, right? It's engagement across differences. And I have done some work um, and there are a bunch of organizations I'm gonna, I can provide a list to you who are um, building relationships with people who are different in some socially salient way where we think that that's the enemy now or that's evil or if they disagree with me, they must be somehow flawed or they wanna harm people. Um, so we, um, we want to sort of talk about that and actually trying to cr grapple with and solve these problems together or get at this stuff 
together. And there's a lot of research out there showing that engaging across difference can help moderate our views. Um, because once we start listening to other people, we don't have to agree, we can sit there and disagree all day, but our views are moderated. We tend to think a little bit more critically about our own views. And this can help cultivate humanity, help us see each other as people. Um, okay, so um, with that power of being able to share and co-create and all that comes great responsibility. And this is just a very quick clip, a few seconds. At, uh, at the dueling town halls earlier this week here in the US, uh, the president held a town hall and um, had this exchange happened. Just this week, you retweeted to your 87 million followers a conspiracy theory that Joe Biden orchestrated to have SEAL Team 6, the Navy SEAL Team 6, killed to cover up the, f the fake death of bin Laden. Now, why would you send a lie like that to your followers? It, you retweeted That was a retweet. That was a, an opinion of somebody, but, and that was a retweet. I'll put it out there. People can decide for themselves. I don't the take president. a position. You're not like someone's crazy uncle who no, can no, just retweet no, no. whatever. That was a retweet, and I do a lot of retweets, and frankly, because the... So, um... So uh, the, the, the moment when she said, you're not, you're the president, not someone's crazy uncle. And I, I wanted to really call that out and forgive me if that sounds a little partisan, I certainly have a bias one way or the other, but that wasn't my point. My point was we have a responsibility. And that's the other thing is uh, when I'm talking to my students, I really drive home the responsibility and the ethics that go along with that. You're not, you know, you're no longer just someone who can go out there and unknowingly throw stuff around. You have to really think about what you're doing. Don't be the crazy friend or the crazy uncle, you know, take some ownership of, of your, uh, of what you're doing. Uh, Fawn, anything you want to add there? No, nope, but um, we did have somebody come in after I put the link yes. to the slide deck that you'll need in just a moment in the chat room. Oh, thank you. I, I okay, I, I can thank you. Um, okay, so now we want to actually do and I guess we'll work. So fun, we could work all of us together or split people into two groups. What would you prefer to do? I don't know what would the group like I think we could work together. Um, we're a small enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, great. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to um, we can do any of these stories and uh, maybe if anyone has a preference between A through D, let us know, or if there's something you want to do instead, let us know. But um, does anyone have a preference at all? And forgive me, oh, go ahead. D. D, D. okay, ele election ballot fraud. Let's do election ballot fraud. So here's what we wanna do. We want to see what's out there about election ballot fraud. and. My, um, so we want you to do a search and maybe a couple of you can do Twitter, a couple of you can do YouTube or just some general searches. My guess is though, that um, you may not, your, your algorithms may be so in tune to you that you may not actually get right away. So we want you to add the word conspiracy if you're not seeing and, I, and, I, and see what comes up or you can also search on the term uh, election ballot fraud uh, Antifa or election ballot fraud, um, alt right or or whatever you know. To add some words just to see what's out there, and so take some time to do your own searches to see what you come up with with regard to election ballot fraud. Um, and this is a very U.S. focused uh, uh, topic, but for those who are not in the U.S., if you have any discussion going on in your own space, please bring that in. Any How questions? much time should we take about? five minutes sure maybe three to five minutes we'll check in at three minutes okay And as Raina has wonderfully done, thank you, Raina, for that link. If you see any other links um, or uh, information that you think we should know, go ahead and share it in the chat and we can collectively take a peek at it.
look at all of this greatness. So let's um, uh, maybe in like 20 seconds ish finish up. And then um, if each of you could summarize what you found. Um, so when you're ready, if anyone would like to start. Yeah. And if you wanted us to click on it for you yes. or share, if you can, if you have the ability to share screen, I don't know if you do. I think the idea, the, yeah, you're welcome to, or I can just share screen and click either way. Okay. I can also. All right. So Raina, you shared this New York Post article. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So I searched uh, on uh, DuckDuckGo to get rid of my personal algorithms. And that was the first article that popped up when I put in um, your exact words. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, it's very vague with a whistleblower who's saying that he's a top Democratic operative that has thrown elections with voter fraud. Um, and they're really putting the scare on with um, local elections, which are um, swayed by a small number of votes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what I noticed is that this, I mean, whether or not it's true, we have an anonymous source and it comes from the post, which is, you know, I, I, I question it's, uh, you know, I, I would rather know from the post who the source was, whereas I might trust anonymous sources elsewhere. But it's very much talking about small elections, which is no good if it's true, but how does it factor into a larger election? Um, and, and how did you, how did you, uh, did you believe this? Do you think Absolutely it's got merit? Not. I don't believe anything when someone's not willing to say that I said it. Fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. Um, I'm not a firm. I'm not a big believer in uh, anonymous tips. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. All right. So the fact that there was an anonymous source that that did it for you, um, and and um, anybody else have any thoughts about this story? Um, do you believe it? If so, why? If you don't, if so, why? All right, and for, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say one thing that I notice whenever I encounter news like this too, is if it doesn't fit with my frame, um, I'm automatically, I because I'm a little more sensitive to that, I automatically don't believe it. Like I'm very, very skeptical, but I'm less, I'm more likely to believe something that might come from, you know, a news source that I use all the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, let's go to another uh, link and tell me, uh, let's see, uh, let's do the Heritage Foundation um, election integrity. Um, and we're gonna talk about veracity. Actually, before we do that though, let me just mention veracity, framing and reliability. Um, because as, as we know, we start here, um, is the information factual? And what was your assumption as, as Fawn said about, about our own frames and how that means we're gonna process information? Um, and, and remembering to question our frames and then look or quite, you know, and then what is our frame who, and then not only our frame, but the framing of the story, who exactly is the audience for the story? Um, are you the audience for the story? And how do you know whether you are or not? Um, and if you're not, how might you frame it? So it's relevant to you. Um, and I'm gonna give an example of that in a little bit. And then reliability, who's the source? How many sources were used? Um, what are their affiliations and what is the content creator's pattern of reliability? So I think the post article fails big time on this particular slide. All right, let me jump back to that Heritage Foundation article. Um, and, while, you, uh, um, oh. while you do that though, when people share, because I was, I, it was kind of an um, unplanned um, moment, but I thought it really interesting that we automatically share the things that we do. So um, Raina, for example, said she went to DuckDuckGo because she knew, you know, you you offered um, the advice to add conspiracy to the end of it if our filters, the algorithms on our searches would take us to familiar places. Um, so she knew also to go to DuckDuckGo to use a um, 
a search that she hadn't used before to kind of circumvent those filters that just give us um, our, you know, echo chamber um, algorithms. And then also, you know, this idea of, um, you know, when you're, when we're searching and we know something about a site. So, um, describing the process of looking for these kinds of things was really interesting too, because this is what we need to make visible to our students that we tend to take for granted as educators. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. So is there anybody so far? I see the Heritage Foundation is yours. So I'm gonna go actually to something from a participant. Um, I see Ralph, Camilo, Daniel. Um, uh, would you, who wants to jump in and share? Cheryl, who wants to jump in and I'll click on whatever link you'd like me to and you can talk about it. I'm gonna go to Ralph. Okay, Ralph, I'm clicking on your White House. Okay. Talk a little bit about this one. <clears throat> um, so um, I'm guessing I thought it was interesting because this was a Heritage Foundation report that was basically uh, reposted by whitehouse.gov, um, which is interesting. And if you just look at the, the way that this document is laid out, it's you know definitely suggesting that election fraud is this like enormous problem since this is about 300 and some pages. Uh, but they, of course, have like basically one or two incidents per page. And some of them are things like somebody fraudulently entering 33 ballots in a school board election in Ohio um, and stuff like that. I'm going to save this for uh, entertainment reading later because I kind of <laughs> like the idea of it. Yeah, this is, and, and I was I actually one of my questions was over what time period is this since the beginning of the Republic or is this well I, I did see something that went back to the 90s I didn't go through it enough to see what you know the the, the total range that it involves yeah, that's um, interesting but yeah, yeah. and if it, yeah and a thousand instances of voter fraud is not good of course we don't want voter fraud but does right. that prove that it, it's a rampant problem or does that prove that we're on top of it, right? right. So, and yet, of course, if, if what you're trying to do is suggest that this is a large scale problem, you would never want to include what percentage of the actual number of votes that actually was, which is gonna be uh, a fraction that I don't pay attention to, so. Right, so what can imagine? What I can imagine Reba Biba doing is actually doing that math. What is the percentage, da da da, and, what, and, and, and then maybe doing something fun. The red here is also like, oh, this is a critical issue. Um, and so we're going to get to co content creation in a moment. Let's look at a couple more. Um, Cheryl, could you please sh talk about, um, here, I'll click on this, the debunking Donald Trump's voter fraud conspiracy. Oh, that's us. Well, you look at that, Raina said, if we don't trust our government, we won't trust the information they produce. And so again, I thought that was really interesting too, that Ralph pointed that out, that it was reposted by whitehouse.gov. And I'm thinking back 10 years or so when I first started teaching information literacy to my students, I would tell them, oh, look at the .com, .org, .gov, be a little careful with .org, right? But you can trust .gov, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's see. Um, back let's in the see. day. <laughs> <laughs> or, or so we thought, but I guess that goes back to that decolonizing point that, you know, again, it's all about that framing, what information is put out and for what purposes. Yeah, and to Raina's point, we can see now, like if we can't trust our government or if we can't trust official sources, which, and, and we don't have a frame or a guide for how to do information, then we do jump into that conspiracy theories place. So. So how do we provide students with a framework? Um, anyway, let's do one more story here. Um, hold on, so sorry. Let me redo this. Um, so Daniel, this is yours that you shared. You wanna talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so I just went um, into, um, like opened up a tab and then typed in Twitter and then it was signed into mine and I forgot to like, take into account like the algorithms that I guess already set for me. So when I did go look for um, election fraud and then I typed in conspiracy, it even then like took a while for me to find something that might look like as like what we're looking for, like the false nar narratives and things like that. Um, but I did find this article linked by Apple News, mm -hmm. um, just saying that like, it, it looks like uh, the president's attempts to um, delegitimize the election have 
been fruitful in his pursuit and a lot of people are taking that into account and yeah i guess it's affecting the way that people are voting yeah thank you for finding this and um absolutely and this is why it's critical for us to you know inc incorporate uh, what's the word fail safe or mm -hmm. so that we kind of try to stop this process if we can mm -hmm. um the last thing jeff uh you did a fact checking story here on voter fraud from snopes um so anything you want to say about that it was helpful because you know i don't i don't know enough a lot of times when i look at the story to be able to judge whether for sure it is or isn't and so sometimes some of these fact checkers can be helpful but again, we don't want to think that they are like the objective truth. Yes. But with this case, it did some of the work for us so that we could see this one claim had some elements of truth and some elements uh, that were not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, what's yeah. true? What's and sites like this too, just in everything that we've shared. So even though like Daniel, you said that, you know, you're, you went to a place where your algorithm was already set up for you and that's what it showed reflected back to you. But also looking at things like Snopes and these other articles, even just seeing the difference in the way that information is presented, um, even if we still need to be a little bit critical of Snopes, it gives us this um, other place to start to take um, several steps back and consider what it is that we are um, looking at comparing that side by side with the Heritage Foundation, for example, and thinking about, oh, well, what's the percentage of voters? Maybe that's something I, that I hadn't thought of before. So just the act of going through um, multiple sources can be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Right. And of course, that's lateral reading, get off the page. But, the, but now I want to get to the key point about how because the point is not to settle into our own echo chambers and believe what we believe, right? The point is, how do we work together to combat this issue? Um, and what I truly believe and what, I, what we really wanna talk about today is this idea of engagement. And that means co-creation. And that means, uh, um, hold on, I will put my present on so this doesn't look, um, excuse me, so sorry. Um, and so I wanna have a conversation now with you about how you would, um, oh, let's get, let me escape out of this. Uh, I'm so sorry, it's just turned blank and uh, I'm gonna refresh this page. It might help if you stop sharing the share again and go back okay. and share. If you... Oh yeah, that might've been, okay, here we go. I think maybe that did it. Um, okay, so the idea of reclaiming the narrative um, and, and engaging with people across divides, because we can sit here in our filter bubbles, our echo chambers all day and be shocked and this and that. Um, so what I want to do now is I want to have a discussion together, or what we want, excuse me, about how we would speak to people um, that maybe we don't agree with, but that we need to work together with um, because this community is all of our shared collective responsibility. So we're gonna have that quick conversation and then I'm gonna have you um, choose a platform or tool and identify information. Um, first of all, would you say that this group is an echo chamber? Would you say that we are a filter bubble here? I think so. <laughs> based yes. on what we've heard everybody say about their articles. Right. All right. So let's have a discussion about you have, and I, I think this is relevant for any country, but when I'm talking about U.S. communications history, we've always been, we've always had disagreements, but back in the 18th century, I may have hated your politics, but I still had to help you get your cow out of a ditch, or you had to help me mend my fence, right? Like, so I could, hate your politics, but you're still my neighbor and we got to figure it out. Right. And, and I think I want to sort of in that spirit, we are still each other's neighbors and in, in, in some of us, for some of us families, right. Who are, who are, you know, think very differently. Um, so let's talk about how we can, first of all, build a relationship with someone or a connection. Maybe it's just, maybe it's just a connection with someone across a difference like this. What might you do? What, like, what might you do to try to connect with 
this person and maybe have a person in your mind. I see that we're getting close to time. So um, we are gonna do this fairly quickly, but if everyone can go around and, um, and uh, um, Ralph, what might you do to, to not even convince, but, but make a connection? Um, well, it just occurs to me that it maybe might be useful to talk about the difference between confirmation bias and bubbles, because just because you're in a bubble doesn't mean you're not aware of your confirmation bias tendencies True. True. and acknowledging that everybody has those, you know, yeah. um, and that once you've acknowledged that, then you can become a little bit more aware when what you're in the bubble is fulfilling that. No, you're absolutely right. That's totally true. Um, and so, but as far as build, making a, building a relationship, what what do you do to build, or what would you do to either build a relationship or make a connection or something something meaningful with someone who's different from you? Right. Yeah. Well, I think just I mean just real quickly, I think finding um, shared values. I, I live around a lot of people I have very strong political disagreements with, but you know we're on the same block. So I think part of it is get out of your house and talk to people. You know. <laughs> Yes. Talk to your neighbors, you know. Okay, yeah, get out of your house, talk to people, talk to neighbors. And I would actually say explicitly name those shared values. Hey, we mm -hmm. both care about uh, keeping the street looking nice. We both care about, you know, the kid down the block who needs help with the bite, whatever it is. Like we both, we all care about that. Um, what else, Daniel, what might you do? Oh, Camilo to... had his hand. Oh, I'm raised. so sorry, sorry, Camilo, forgive me. The only word that came to my mind was compassion. And, and it's, by understanding that we are all humans, that we live on the same planet, that we have even more, um, I, I would say, critical things like uh, to think about together, like what is going on with our planet right now, and what, and just be rigorous in finding what unites us, mm -hmm. not what divides us. And I, and I think I have the feeling that that we are moving towards that point, but we are that we are more aware that being critical is not only about uh, finding dividing points and what's um, how we are being separated, how we are being uh, segregated. But uh, I think the call to me, honestly, uh, I feel the need to transcend the critical to a to a point that I can look at, at the problems from different perspectives. But at the same time, think of uh, of everyone, that every, all the people that are involved as humans, uh, who have their very own right to think different uh, or differently, yeah. and, and then just sen sen being sensitive enough to find that common thing that can unite us. That would be that would make a difference. Yes, that common thing, and it's again back to Ralph's shared values. That one common thing. And if and we're talking and, and Camilo, I love that you're talking universally. You're absolutely right. When you operationalize that down to that person across from you, that you know, it's it it comes down to ask you know asking a question and listening. And I know that seems basic, but we've completely lost sight of how to do that. Um, we've completely lost sight of it. So asking and then listening and then finding a common commonality. And then once you have that connection, it's difficult to not see that person as human. It's really difficult to not see that person as human. And then all of a sudden when you disagree, it's like, well, they're not evil, they're human. And I like that they love the same movie I like. So I guess we have, I guess we can do this, right? Um, Daniel, you're nodding. I'm wondering if you have anything you wanna to add to that. Yeah, I agree. I think listening is one of those skills that we kind of lost sight of and something that we really need to work on if we wanna be compassionate and block out maybe some of that bias that we have. Um, before we maybe pass judgment on on others. Um, I was gonna say like, I guess in, in my case, when we used to be in class, like in person, face to face, we would always, um, like with my classmates, we'd always talk about like traffic, parking, uh, just casual things like the weather, things that we all share, no matter like what our thoughts are or opinions may be. Oh, I love that because, it, you know, we always think that that's, um filler but it's not it's it's that weave it's that it's those threads yes oh thank you daniel i love that um cheryl what might you do yeah i agree with um daniel i think small talk has been somewhat you know underrated in terms of building a connection with people i think that you know over you know you know whether it's a neighbor whether it's someone you don't know at all you know uh yeah you can talk about anything really that's not a not a super hot topic 
it, to build to build a kind of relationship at least first before you then then delve into you know uh, things that you want to talk about that you know might be more contentious. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raina. Oh, Raina might not be able to talk right now. Jeff. <laughs> Sorry, you don't have to talk either if you don't want. Yeah, that okay. was funny. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate it. Uh, I've been just taking a lot of notes. No, it, to me, it just keeps coming back to what you started this whole presentation with in the beginning, the whole notion of humanizing. I, I really appreciate that. And I find it very kind of refreshing. Yeah. And this isn't to this isn't to say that you can do this with everybody, right? Like if I'm if I'm faced with someone that I think is gonna harm me or harm someone I love and their rhetoric, it could lead to direct harm it's kind of already too late. Like we've got to deal with that a little bit differently, but I think we can chip away at that by doing this other thing, by coming back down here. And so to take this in anyway, I'm sorry, Fawn, let me actually go to you. I have a couple other things I want to say, but I'm, I'm, I oh, got no, excited. Go ahead and finish. Go ahead and finish. So what I would say is when you take this into the classroom with your students, um, have them lead on where they want to create and how they want to create, but, but giving them the parameters of, of, you know, you are tasked with figuring out how to connect with someone across a difference. You are tasked with figuring out how you can find common ground without agreeing. Who cares? You know, who cares if you agree or not? And then start to educate each other. And, and, and there is a real important, there's a real important um, task of creating safe spaces and making sure that if you have students who feel marginalized or are marginalized in your, uh, in your group, that you protect them and make sure that it's safe for them to do this work. Um, and, and, and then letting them create with the goal toward really communicating and connecting. Um, and uh, and uh, the, I wanna say that I've added to the slide and Fawn and I will add additional um, organizations that are engaging across difference doing exactly this work. Um, Civity is an organization I work with and they engage uh, leaders with communities uh, with like so in a, on a local sense in a city, uh, a, a the government a government group an organization uh, in that space wanting to engage with with sub communities in that community who feel marginalized or are marginalized. All sides is doing um, uh, something called oh it's called All Sides Connect. They just changed their name, and All Sides Connect is something you can do in the classroom where you can connect digitally to um, classrooms in another part of the world who um, it, where students can it, can go through a very structured way of engaging. Um, Living Room Conversations uh, is uh, aligned with All Sides and All Sides Connect and they're basically bringing groups of four to six together to do this work. Braver Angels is trying to engage across uh, political differences, uh, differences of class, uh, or socioeconomic class and differences of race and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. um, and they're trying to bring people together. And there are many others we, we will add. Um, but I guess my point is to bring this work into your media literacy education, bring the engagement work and the, um, and the create, creating with an eye toward really thinking about who the audience is. Um, I wanna show one final example, but first Fawn, uh, it's a very inappropriate example. So I'm gonna tell you about it kind of post, but Fawn, you, you first. Oh. oh, well, I just wanted to um, I'll, really quick, I'll just share um, that very last yeah. slide yeah. Um, that had to do with um, one of the important aspects of critical media literacy though, is that we ask our students to then, um, you know, tell their own story, um, reclaiming the narrative. Um, so one of the ways that you could do that, and I've done this kind of work with um, secondary students is to have them choose a platform or a tool because we also have to be mindful of, you know, spaces like social media for our students. Um, kind of um, goes back to that brave spaces idea that is there ever really a safe space right especially for people who are um, you know historically marginalized or under underrepresented um, in certain spaces um, identifying misinformation and disinformation kind of like we did through um, various tools that's what the teacher's role is to help us work through that process and then to tell a counter story and um, actually this was inspired by the critical media literacy guide there was this one really great line about um, starting from the voices that are not 
um, typically heard in these spaces to start there instead of with the dominant narrative, right? Or um, to tell your own story of your own community. So telling a counter story um, to kind of fill in not just the blanks of misinformation, but also the stories that aren't typically um, heard in those spaces and addressing issues in the original content. And when you go back to choosing platforms or tools, that's going to shape it shape the way that you do that, right? So if you're using maybe an image, the Heritage Foundation is a good example of putting all of the information that they really want you to focus on, right? Even, um, you know, to the exclusion of other things, but they put everything front and center, the color, everything is designed um, to convey that story for you. And so how would you create a counter story that might tell another um, perspective from that. And then finally to assess, and I really appreciate the point of making a distinction between confirmation bias and echo chambers, because um, I think I mentioned my confirmation bias. When I um, encounter a story that doesn't fit with my personal beliefs, I, I can feel that immediate tension, right? That pushback. Um, whereas our echo chamber, you know, it's me sharing with other people who have the same interests or ideas, um, and I, I'm going to get that kind of um, cycle going. So um, going back to all of the ways that Gina said that we can connect across difference to tell a full counter story. Um, so, you know, really kind of delineating or decomposing those steps for students and then allowing them to create something that either could be posted um, in a public space um, and become part of civic engagement or um, even just to go through the process themselves, I think is really helpful. Gina. Yes, thank you. I mean, that that is our um, that is our presentation. The one example I was going to give um, that you can look up yourself is uh, it's it's a it's a U.S. election ad, and it's get your booty to the polls. And it's a, a group in Atlanta um, pulled together some some women who work at strip clubs, and they are they are talking about look, this is why it's important to vote. And the audience is very clear, and the message is very specific, and it's brilliant and wonderful. And um, but because because of um, you know, I don't want to objectify women. I didn't want to necessarily share it here, but I would say uh, the the women in the ad are brilliant, and um, and they are explaining uh, in a way that their audience is really going to connect with why voting is important. And so I thought really knowing your audience and connecting, it's a good example, um, but it's a fraught and problematic example too. Um, but I just thought it, 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 uh, it, it was a good example of media engaging with a group that isn't usually engaged with. So that was, um, yes. Do you want me to share the link to that? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Fine. Uh, um, I will get it right now. But anyways, thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions or comments uh, that they wanted to? Can I go? Yes, please. I am delighted to see that we are, I mean, I don't know if it's because I'm seeing from a different perspective or it's really happening, but, I, but I, I get the feeling that we are moving towards a more human perspective of what it means to um, stand for for us today to be critical and to do critical media literacy. And I just to stay in this mental mindset that, that is just focusing on the deconstruction of the, of the messages and the structures, but also to transcending that and, and, and bringing it back to us, to, to our humanity. And personally, um, I have felt frustration. I mean, I, I'm, this is, I'm, I'm not, I haven't been always on this point, but I felt the frustration of trying to counter, encounter, encounter things and not seeing changes because of this, this solid and, and rigid structures that we may be surrounded by. So it all came back to me um, and, and just think about what I can really do in my square, my, my square feet. What can I do in this uh, from my own perspective? And it brought me back to myself. So, uh, so that, that was, it led me to think of what I can possibly do to be that change that I cannot see outside. And my perspective started changing. Uh, and, and the kids that I work with, because I, I come from a different background, just working with uh, pre-service teachers in Colombia who are going to be teachers of English coming to the U.S. Uh, to work with kids, 
and and feeling that and at the university where I came from, like we were like in this bubble, like critical, um, very, very, very critical, maybe extreme critical. Mm -hmm. And then I come to America where I cannot be like that. And 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 just work with little kids in a in an ESL classroom, trying to teach them like uh, in this case writing. And I'm thinking of one group specifically. And and it came to the point that I I felt it was not good. I, I was not doing a good service. I, I was feeling I was indoctrinating them, trying to make them see what I was seeing in a commercial. Uh, and then I stopped and I said, okay, wait, I'm going to meet them where they are. And because they were looking and they were seeing the good things about the commercial, the good messages that are uniting them, like how this Coca-Cola commercial is teaching me to be kind. But I was, I was trying to push in the harder and like, what about the sugar? What about the, 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 this and this, and what about the, the plastic? What about the, the many things that, but they were looking at something that was beyond my eyes and that's when I came to start thinking of what how how is it how isn't it more important just to start like starting from where they are how they feel and I think Gina you said something key for me today um, that that for those who feel segregated and they didn't feel like I thought they should feel so this emotional part that I brought at the beginning is where this is leading me towards now. Like, how do we feel about those texts that we are reading or watching or consuming? Are we really feeling this segregation? I know there's a lot of things to think of and, and, and there's a lot of critical things to look at, but, um, but it's bringing me back to compassion and my humanity. So um, that's what I want to say. And thank you, because I, I, I see that there's more people out there in the same field that it's uh, like in this conference that I, I couldn't see these as much in the previous conferences. So I'm very delighted. Thank oh, you so very much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And, you know, you reminded me to say, and I think Fawn and I talked about this, is, um, is to take it back to its basics, right? Like when we look across some sort of difference, like you're trying to hurt me or you're trying to take away my rights. It's like, it, often it comes from this really, if you, if you dig down, it comes from the same space. I, I am fearful of whatever, or I just want my kids to have a safe space, or I just want, and then it's operationalized in different ways. And so, so that's why like drawing back down to that space where we can find a connection and then working out from there to try to get at the larger issues through reverberations. And again, it's not everybody, but Camila, I really, I really, what you said really resonates with me. Thank you. Yeah. And I think that's such a great point too. And it ties in with what Gina had us do earlier, where we were thinking about how we might, what moves we might make to connect with other people. Um, and I'm sure that we can all think of examples of times where we experience that. Like when I first started teaching, I would sit down with parents and they felt they came in on the defense and I came in on the defense. But once we realize that we're all there for the same thing, right? We want what's best for that kid. Um, it's like all of that tension diffused. And so I started doing that immediately in the meetings. Like this is, I, this is where I'm coming from. This is what I really want. And I also watched another teacher Teacher do um, use social media for digital self portraits with her students and she she had an agenda the first time she wanted them to realize that they were on screens too much and that it was kind of she was more of the protectionist you know with social media but then she started moving like you did Camilo to the other side seeing that there are some really rich things happening and it was really important to their lives it's part of the way that they communicate and their identities and they started to meet each other in the middle it was really interesting Oh, I love that. Any other questions, comments, concerns, thoughts that you want to share before we wrap up? I know we're over time, so I apologize. Um, thank you. Before we leave, I just want to add something that I don't want to miss. And it's that I, I am not disregarding the fact that, I mean, these kids were, were able to see about it, like the critical things. They were able to analyze the sugar. They were able to analyze many things. But then even after that, their main focus was uh, the values they were learning. So, uh, so there are, there are segre there's segregation, there is division, there is, uh, there is injustice 
um, and and but everything depends on the eyes that are seeing it, right? And and the, and the person that is feeling it also. But these kids really, really were able to deconstruct those texts uh, like critically. But even after that, this they, they they were just focusing more on the value. So that that was really powerful for me. Yeah. Yes, I appreciate it. Yeah, like for instance, starting where they are and then recognizing that we young kids can do more than we think they can. They're more perceptive than we think they are and, and get it. Yeah. And they just need some guidance uh, or, you know, framing structure. So. Okay. All right. Anything else at all? It's been a pleasure to for Afan and I to talk with you. I guess I'll just say one last thing. Um, I was part of a seminar or webinar um, for the second session that ended off with like all this change or this trans transformative um, like energy that we want to see happening on. Um, it, it takes some time. Like it's it's definitely a process, right? But the goal as like teachers or as edu educators is to plant those seeds. And I feel like that definitely applies to what we talked about today in, in this session. Oh, great. I love that because the changes, it happens with us, right? Mm -hmm. And so we all have to go through that process. We used to say, you're, you might not change any, you're not going to change anybody's minds today, right? When we would have circles with each other, like, okay, but you could see how over time people's, you know, start to come to that point. Well, thank you, everyone. This was such a great conversation. This was very rich. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop the video recording. Thank you. Great, thank you.